This is a short story called Nightmare Cuisine. I have written about restaurant cauchemar in previous travel guides, but given its recent infamy, I thought I should make my knowledge and opinions of that most essential Parisian eatery clear. The restaurant cauchemar, or nightmare restaurant as we English patrons call it, has belonged to the Bernier family for generations and is currently occupied by Madame Bernier and her three daughters, Apolline, Elion, and Camille. All three daughters were trained in the traditional style of nightmare preparation. The details of this are, naturally, a family secret, but I understand it involves the consummation of raw nightmares. It is difficult to imagine forcing something dark and still writhing down the throats of children. Hands cannot shake at all when you slice spheres open for their essential invigorating ingredients, and this is apparently the only method trusted by the Berniers. There is a story that young Camille brought a knife to bed one night. The family were awoken by screaming and found that Camille, half asleep still, had pinned her own nightmare to the wall. Before anyone could stop her, she grabbed the shrieking creature and shoved it into her mouth. Men of medicine, who have not met Camille, will call this fiction, dreamt up to advertise the restaurant. They will point to case studies of, on the madness that follows, such self-contamination, the sleeplessness, the sickening, and, in the better cases, the dying of the patients who have consumed their own nightmares in less reputable establishments. I have met Camille. I have seen the nightmares counter behind her dark eyes and how shadows seem to shrink away from her, and I do not doubt the veracity of the story. Now full grown, Camille is the family's provider of produce. I asked her how a lady such as her could travel in Paris at night alone. She smiled a hunter's smile, full of daggers. I know where my fears are, and they aren't hiding in the dark. When the produce is in, the sisters set to work, and their mannerisms are as distinctive as their rules. Camille slices open the nightmares and divides them into useful ingredients. She works like a butcher. Sometimes the shadowy creatures bleed like meat or red juices fly explosively as though cutting open a tomato. The substance is getting trapped under Camille's fingernails. Sometimes they ooze a purple caramel substance, and sometimes there is no liquid at all, merely the crunch of a raw potato, or bone. Apolline is an artist. She is able to create the most delectable constructions, finding the thrill that can come from falling from a great height with chocolate and crushed rose petals formed into a delectable swan. This item is greatly admired by the ladies who frequent the restaurant. Elion is a mathematician of the family. She can assume what exhilaration should be paired and with which wine, whether a heart racing run through an imagined abandoned fairground is strong enough for a main meal or an entree. It would not be unfair to say that Elion is responsible for the makeup of the menu. Of course, one of Restaurant Cauchemar's most famed experiences belonged to those brave enough to go off menu. The process for doing so is surprisingly simple. After providing a lock of hair on entry, many fine ladies balk at this requirement, but it is necessary to prevent self contamination. You make your request. Camille, who is normally sequestered in the kitchen, comes out to meet you. You must maintain eye contact for as long as she deems necessary. There is then a congress among the sisters, who then decide upon and create a small meal they, and create the meal they think you need. The experience has been called life-changing by many who have undergone it. Dr. Geraldo Labriola create, credits the meal to his restaurant, at Restaurant Cauchemar as the source of inspiration for his new designs for a flying machine. He has promised Madame Bernier and her daughters a flight, free of charge, once the prototypes have been perfected. Madame Bernier has made it clear that neither she nor her daughters will take part in any attempt to break the laws of gravity. However, Eliane has stated that she feels no qualms in accepting Dr. Labriola's inv invitation, as she is fully convinced his contraption will never leave the ground. <laughs> I have suspected, after spying a sketchbook filled with landscapes drawn as a from the air, that Apolline may harbour private fantasies of the doctor's efforts. Camille has made her enthusiasm well known. At all of Dr. Labriola's subsequent visits, she apparently emerges from the kitchen, often knife in hand, to remind him of his promises. Whether the Italian's attempts at flight will be successful remains to be seen. But I don't doubt that, if they are, he will likely find it necessary to build a second machine for Camille Bernier's personal use. My experience of going off menu encouraged me to compile my scribblings into, a final travel, into my first travel guide. It could be argued, therefore, that I owe my literary career, such as it is, to the Bernier sisters, which is why I feel obligated to provide what I believe to be the facts of the matter surrounding the recent court proceedings brought against them. On 17th of October this year, Monsieur Herriot, a gentleman of significant fortune, walked into Restaurant Cauchemar and proclaimed that he would eat whatever the sisters cared to put in front of him. Camille appeared from the kitchen and held his gaze in silence for longer than usual. He returned her stare with a smile. Finally, she said a few quick words to her sisters and Elion stepped forward. I apologise, Monsieur, but we cannot serve you today. If you'd be so kind as to come back tomorrow. This caused quite a stir among those present and, when news spread, to Paris as a whole, no one had ever been refused service at Restaurant Cauchemar. Could it be that Camille has lost her gift? The next day, when Monsieur Herriot arrived again, the restaurant was fuller than it had ever been. 
It is said that he rather enjoyed the attention his lunch had caused. There was an anticlimax then, and the sisters emerged, ashen in face and hair askew, with a single bowl of soup. They presented it to Monsieur Herriot, and stood by the table to wait for his verdict. This was irregular in itself, as the girls rarely stay out of the kitchen for long. They are usually confident in their work and eager to return to it, rather than witnessing its effects. Monsieur Herriot put the first spoonful into his mouth and almost choked on it. Spluttering and red in the face, he tried to push the bowl away. What happened next has been well documented. At least, the actions of the sisters are common knowledge. It is likely that Elion held his arms down and Apolline his legs. Undoubtedly, Camille did forcibly pour the rest of the soup into his mouth and held his skull until he was forced to swallow. What is certain is that all three did indeed ignore his screams of terror, which is rarely meant. What is rarely mentioned, however, is that the Berniers were joined in this effort by many of the female patrons who were there that day. Many hands held Monsieur Herriot down, but only three ladies were named by the police. I have been sworn to secrecy in regards to the identities of the others, and even if I weren't, I should be disinclined to reveal them. After his ordeal, Monsieur Herriot was rushed to hospital. Other than some minor bruising, his injuries were not external ones. His information did nothing to stop his screaming or begging. When time proved to be just as useless a remedy, he was transferred to the asylum. I have visited him recently. Terror still stalks him, and I have been told that he finds the sight of his shadow extremely distressing. He sleeps but little, and when he does sleep, his body convulses, lashing out at his scenes that do not exist outside of his mind. At this point, I would like to make one thing clear. The investigation in court case followed and uncovered no evidence that Monsieur Harriot was contaminated with his own nightmares. The Berniers provided a large sample of the soup to investigators, and no traces of poisons or contaminants were found. If this is not enough, a sizable section of Paris's female population testified on behalf of the sisters. All have provided the nightmare ingredients, and some had even witnessed the Berniers working through the night, rendered, rendering down the bone-like substances into soup. Upon further investigation, the nature of these nightmares and Monsieur Harriot have become clear. Each woman had interacted with Monsieur Herriot, though not all knew him by name. These women ranged from a young street sweeper to that most excellent lady, Mademoiselle Bonaire, known for her philanthropic endeavours. Their tales varied in measure, but not in style. For those more fortunate, their experience of Monsieur Herriot remained an unsettling look at a function or a too familiar touch that lingered too long. For others, his behaviour stretched to the violence of crimes, and for the sake of the woman and my own countenance, I shall not go into details. Suffice to say that nightmares featuring this man have been plaguing Paris for quite some time. Though there is no attempt to expand the laws governing nightmare preparation, there currently was no crime in the production of the food that included nightmares about the consumer. The assault charges against the sisters were also quietly dropped, and they were permitted to return home. After these events, I fear for the future of the establishment. However, thus far they remain as busy as ever, though it must be said that the clientele has gained a more feminine air. I would urge anyone to go to restaurant Cauchemar. Their delicacies are not to be equaled anywhere in the world and their experience is utterly without danger, if one is of good moral fibre. If not, I would advise that you remain sheltered by the menu, and try to avoid meeting Camille's gaze. Yeah. <laughs>